Let's run a comparison with today's aquatic reptiles. Let's look at a crocodile. Crocodiles are in a different group to dinosaurs. You mustn't imagine that they're totally closely related. But the way in which this crocodile, this saltwater crocodile, is behaving is exactly parallel to the way that I believe that the dinosaurs behave. I believe that dinosaurs had their bodies immersed in water. That's why you get those, uh, those back scales, just like those of a modern day crocodile. And I believe that we could here be looking at the way in which dinosaurs behave. Now it has sometimes been said, people say to me, well, well if dinosaurs were recorded, they'd have webbed feet. Crocodiles are aquatic, and indeed they don't walk on, but they actually float. But they don't have webbed feet either. They have claws that are quite like the claws of a monstrous human hand. I was out in Costa Rica earlier this year looking at crocodiles. And if you look at a crocodile and compare it with a tree-dwelling lizard like this one, you can see, I mean, you get the sort of hint as to how these lizards are vaguely genealogically connected vaguely historically related to dinosaurs. I mean, you can always imagine that you're looking, can't you, at a, at a dinosaur. But if you look on the mud flats at the crocodiles, I mean, these are enormous creatures, and you can see so many hints as to how a dinosaur might have worked. Now, T-Rex is an interesting case in point, because T-Rex has little tiny limbs, and T-Rex would have four load-bearing limbs. It only lost the power to use its four limbs, I contend, because its body was supported by water. And indeed, there is a, an engineer in Los Angeles. Rob has suggested to me, rather interestingly, Rob Reigns, that possibly these uh, four limbs were vacuum breakers, that if the, the thing lay down on mud, if Tyrannosaurus rested its chest on mud, it wouldn't be able to stand up again because of the suction. It had these little hands at the front, you could move them and break the vacuum. So Rob Ray has had an interesting little theory, and I really think he could be right. So let's look at another creature that lives in water, the hippo. Because many people have said to me, uh, I don't think these, these dinosaurs could swim. And I'm saying, well, they didn't actually have to swim. What they have to do is be able to walk. And hippos are pretty ancient, though they don't date back quite to the dinosaur era, of course. But have a look at hippos. You know that BBC logo where you have hippos swimming in a circle, it's all wrong, because surprising as it may seem, hippos can't swim. Although they breathe air, they look far more relaxed underwater and can hold their breath for up to six minutes at a time. Their feet have nails, not hooves, and are partly webbed. Because they can't swim, hippos don't like being out of their depth. They prefer to keep their feet firmly on the bottom. But being a non-swimmer isn't the disadvantage it seems. Hippos are virtually weightless underwater. It's easier to use a kind of spacewalk than to swim against the current. The big shock is how fast these beach boys move on land. They're not distance runners, but they can cut quite a dash in the hundred meters. As a hippo submerges, special valves automatically seal its ears and nostrils, but that doesn't stop it hearing or communicating underwater. Those buzzy, clicky sounds are made inside the hippo's closed-off airways. They sound a lot like the clicks produced by dolphins, and that's no coincidence. Recent research shows hippos are related to dolphins and whales and share a common ancestor. And there were enormous shallow lakes in earlier eras. These are the lias beds of Glamorgan. And each layer is composed of mud that was at the bottom of an enormous shallow lake. There are lots of dinosaur footprints left in mud like this. Here's a photograph 
from the Morrison strata taken by Jesse Varner in America, which is where dinosaurs have been found. All of these strata are mudstones and, and siltstones and sandstones, the kind of rocks that form at the bottom of water. And it's in those very rocks that you find most of the dinosaur uh, skeletons. And the Morrison strata go on for miles. They go right down, just into Texas, right down into New Mexico, and way, way up into Canada. I mean, these, the beds of these vast shallow lakes are huge, absolutely enormous. Then is the question of movement. This is how mammals move, a computer generated version of how mammals move. Reptiles don't move like that. Modern lizards have an entirely different way of locomotion, which, which doesn't look at all like mammals. Dinosaurs would not have moved in the way that mammals move. And if you look at the largest of the surviving reptiles, let's look at these Komodo dragons. These are in Chicago, where the Nazuma. You just look at the way that these creatures move. They don't look like mammals. They're not leaping about happily from the top of a crested sand dune. They're enormous creatures. And yet we persist in trying to make dinosaurs in recent years look like mammals. It happened with orcas. We were all brought up knowing killer whales as killer whales. And about 20 years ago, people said, killer whales are very judgmental. We should call them orcas, because that's their scientific name. So it was considered unfashionable to call them killer whales anymore, because of its negative overtones. And they all became orcas. But then as more and more television films turned out and showed that they were actually killer whales, and thoroughly deserved the name, they've gone back to being killer whales. And if you look these days on TV, you never hear an orca it's always a killer whale. Ten years ago, it was exactly the opposite. Fashion governs much in science. Just look for the mammalianization of dinosaurs at this film from 2000, made by the Disney Corporation. There you go. Extraordinary thing. No, to my mind, those large herbivores in this rough sketch, this is how they look. This is my interpretation of how those creatures live their lives. Yes, 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 they may have come out to lay their eggs. I'm not saying they could be. They must have. But that's what they evolved for. And let's end with a bit from a BBC documentary program, which actually shows, goes to great lengths to explain how this is all happening at a dried up lake. It hasn't occurred to anybody that the time the dinosaurs were, they hadn't dried up yet. So what you see is a film made about a dried up lake bed with stonking great hundred ton dinosaurs bouncing about on the surface and kicking up dust with their little hooves. This is my final example. And I just ask you to re-flood the landscape with water. And suddenly it all becomes clear, at least I think it does. Its crystalline white crust formed by the retreat of an ancient sea. Occasionally its shores see the movement of herds of dinosaurs.
These are Diplodocus, heading for a nesting site to the south. It is a grim journey for these mighty creatures, and the heat and lack of drinking water weeds out the weaker animals. Al is an experienced hunter, but the herd itself presents a formidable barrier to predators. Extraordinary. With the water in place, it all makes sense. Nothing otherwise, I'm afraid, does. And my view of how T. Rex behaved is like this. When you saw that crocodile lower in the water, that's what I think T. Rex looked like. I think they probably just sat around like that and used those big legs to lunge forward and grab whatever it was. Indeed, they were probably mostly scavengers eating half rotten corpses because, of course, their jaw action did not mean like crocodiles. They couldn't chew. They could only open and shut their jaws. Crocodiles rip meat off by grabbing hold of, a, say, a dead hippo or a buffalo, and then twisting around in the water to pull off the meat. Bizarre way of behaving. Possibly T-Rex did the same. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I am entirely convinced that that is how dinosaurs developed. I think they evolved to be aquatic creatures, which obviously could go on land. And I find it really interesting that the pressure that has been put upon me since it came out is exactly as I said in previous lectures. The, the pressure is to recant, to deny, not to reconsider the evidence, ladies and gentlemen. And if I am ever told I have to recant, then I probably won't. And if I do end up with house arrest, then I promise I shall sit with my dear wife and our trusty dog, sitting at Campari and Soda in the Rose Terrace, and thinking how silly those other paleontologists truly are. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.